Alright. Greetings to everyone and welcome to the lecture, Systems Thinking for Resilient and Inclusive Development. This lecture is the fifth session of the Cigar PH and NRC Lecture Series 2021. This event is organized by the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines Investing in Climate and Disaster Resilience Project of the Ateneo de Manila University and the National Resilience Council in partnership with the Department of Sociology and Anthropology in Ateneo. Our session today is broadcasted live on the Facebook pages of the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines and the National Resilience Council. So please be guided by the reminders and house rules for today's session. <coughs> today's session is recorded for our documentation purposes. All attendees and participants are automatically muted upon entry. And from time to time, you'll have to check this at the bottom of your screen. Um, ensure that the icons of the microphone and the video are crossed out. No? So please use your microphones and videos only when you are called to speak. For our attendees via Zoom, please send your questions through the chat box, again, found at the bottom of your screen, so our team can note this at the open forum. And likewise, for our attendees on Facebook, good morning, you can type in your questions via the comment section. So we begin this webinar with opening remarks from our conveners, starting with Ms. Maria Antonia Yulo Loizaga, President of the National Resilience Council. Ms. Lezaga is also a co-principal investigator at the Coastal Cities Address in the Philippines and a trustee of the Manila Observatory. I now <coughs> hand over the floor to Ms. Tony Loiza. Thank you. Thank you, Ina. Um, I, I'll need to share screen. Thank you, everyone. Um, can you see that screen? Sorry, just to confirm. Yes, Tony. Yes. yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear yes. you, Tony. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to Doc Ems. Our... Thank you. Uh, good morning, Doc Ems. Good morning, Dr. Reynolds, Dr. Tanguanan, and our panel of reactors, Doc Banjo Bautista, Doc Nandi Aldaba, and of course, Justin C., all the way from La Trobe. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the, the National Residence Council and CICAR partners in the local government units <clears throat> that we're working with at the moment from Ormoc, Iloilo, Naga, and, and everyone who's uh, made time to come today. I just wanted to start with a few quick slides and uh, to let you know where we're coming from. Emma and I, a group of us, have really been working together since 2011 under Coastal Cities at Risk 1, which was three, and then of course now Coastal Cities at Risk 2. Um, with the Ateneo de Manila, but also with Manila Observatory. And this is an image that was generated out of the first Coastal Cities at Risk project where we, as, as Emma has said, we try to look at the intersecting physical and social geographies um, that result in risk. And what you see there is a river elevation index um, looking at um, the, the different coastal communities uh, and inland communities that are part of Doc Emma's work, but also um, have been studied over time by the Manila Observatory. Um, there is an additional layer to this slide actually, which is uh, the result of the work of the UP Marine Science Institute under Ando Seringan. We're very grateful to have worked with in Coastal City Center One, wherein he actually plotted and physically mapped and measured all the river constrictions uh, in Metro Manila uh, to come to the conclusion that most of the river constrictions were in fact what we call formal constrictions um, and not um, informal or due to the informal settlements of Metro Manila. 
the main problem that we face um, in terms of the work of the National Resilience Council and the coastal cities at risk is we try to understand risk, hazard exposure and vulnerability, not just to natural hazards, but what we call exposure and vulnerability very recently by the, by the biological hazards of COVID-19 in particular, where we've had all sorts of emerging uh, types of risk uh, because of the different implications of biological hazards on the different systems that make up a city and that make up a country, clearly. And, um, and so the, what are the implications of that in terms of exposure and vulnerability moving forward? We, we've also had um, over time, and you'll see in the literature, a lot of, a lot of deliberation on the def definition of resilience, but clearly systems are in fact at the very center of the definition of resilience and trying to understand not just one system but a system of systems for example in cities is where our work really lies um, in terms of trying and what in fact is needed in order to begin to resolve some of these situations particularly in terms of exposure and vulnerability these are just two images which are favorites of ours um, and really, really portray the <coughs> shifts that are needed in terms of the way we are approaching problems and thinking about <coughs> solutions. So at the end of the day, we are not just of one system, but really a system of systems in terms of our work. Um, in terms of the resilience work that we're doing with, with CICAR, uh, in particular, the social system is where we have tried to pay a, a lot of attention to academically as well as leaders. the day what we would like, in fact, to do is to see disasters and risk in particular um, as opportunities for social change. And that social change has to do with somehow balancing out inequities that have resulted in exposure and vulnerability of certain groups within society, certain ecosystems, um, and certain, certain sectors. So transformation is where we are headed, hopefully. And that means not bouncing back and building back, but really bouncing forward together. So at the NRC, and today we hope to hear much about living with uncertainty um, and risk prevention through systems thinking rather than just relief and response. Uh, and that's where we would like to, in fact, uh, continue the conversation with the CICAR and, and its partners. Lastly, um, I just wanted to show you the very risk versus resilience. And actually this shows a closed loop. Um, as you know, this looks like an SD. Um, model that we've tried to put together here, and this is thanks to Dr. Kendra Gutanko and Justin in the early work of SIGCAR2. What we now know is, of course, that in fact risk is non-linear, as you see here. However, it also is not a closed loop in terms of looking at the way systems behave. So we've tried to put together a framework, and you see there the different pillars, and that and those pillars basically are um, a basis for which we, we measure resilience in local government units and in their stakeholders, both internal and external. But certainly this is a live framework and a live tool and we adjust as we continue to learn from the ground uh, and not from our academic institutions solely. So what to do here, and then I, I'll end with this slide, and I'm hoping that this is in fact the beginning of many conversations that will, that will um, continue, and, and really is to build evidence-informed um, decision-making. Um, you'll hear today from, from Dr. Inflection points, points at which both a crisis can be averted or in fact exacerbated. And really, uh, we, we hope that <coughs> we have leadership and like Doc Emma, for example, that can actually be a translator, someone who can talk to many different sectors, someone who can describe a problem, and someone who can offer solutions. At the end of the day, it's about implementation. And if we can't implement and we cannot monitor and evaluate, then we will never know how resilient we have become or not become. 
So thank you very much for this partnership with SICAR and Ateneo de Manila, the Manila Observatory. Um, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tony. Uh, up next is the co-convener of this lecture series, Dr. Emma Porio. Dr. Porio is the project leader and principal investigator of the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines project and a professor of sociology at Ateneo de Manila University. She's also a science research fellow at the Manila Observatory. So let us welcome Dr. Emma Porio. Thank you, Ina, and thank you very much, Tony, for showing those slides. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't have to talk about all those, you know, loops and all those cards and all those maps that we produce, you know. So thank you very much. I'm really grateful that we are here together today. So in behalf of Father Roberto Yap, SJ, President of the Ateneo de Manila University and project holder of CCRPH, let me welcome you to the fifth lecture of the Climate and Disaster Resilience uh, Series um, 2021. And we do it very well with partnership with the National Resilience Council. I think without the NRC, we cannot see action, you know, translating science into action and application at the local government system. CICAR PH is a consortium of the Ateneo de Manila, the Manila Observatory, and the National Resilience Council in partnership with Ateneo de Naga and Naga City LGU, University of the, Visaya, of the Philippines at Visayas, in partnership with Iloilo City LGU, and the Pamantasan ng Lunsud ng Munting Lupa in partnership with the Manila uh, um, Munting Lupa City LGU. Here in Metro Manila, CCRPH also partners with the City LGU of Quezon City, Pasig City, Valenzuela City, and also with community based organizations like the Buklud Tao, the Integrated uh, Community Food Production System in Disciplina Bignay, the Kelos Foundation in Pasig, among others. Thus, CCARPH is a transdisciplinary action research project. Transdisciplinarity is informed by three principles of knowledge production and mobilization of knowledge for resilience and sustainability with the investments on our, for societal development. We believe that, you know, to make science and technology be applied and be useful into our everyday work of resilience, we believe that one, we must co-generate knowledge with our stakeholders. Number two, we should co-create the capacities of scientists, professionals, and practitioners, which will allow us, if we practice these two principles, it should allow us to be co-owners and be co-benefited in all our engagements and partnerships. Alongside the principles of transdisciplinarity, we also believe that to have a resilient and inclusive development, we have to be systems oriented. The way we engage our LGU partners and the way we apply our science and technology, like the climate and disaster risk assessment with the LGUs of Naga, in partnership with Ateneo de Naga University, this climate disaster risk assessments in Iloilo City in partnership with University of the Philippines Visayas. We engage basically uh, in doing the risk analysis. The assessment we engage with the partners and the academic institutions, with the planners and public safety officers at the local government unit, and in partnership with the communities on the ground. So I would say that partnership is really key to our working with, so public-private partnerships for resilience. Also, we believe that, you know, um, we have to be together. I always tell my group, my scientific team, that by being together, we can be more. So this morning, we are very fortunate and we are quite grateful to the intellectual generosity of our distinguished keynote speakers and panelists. So we have 
I have brought, you know, Bill Reynolds has been a visiting professor in Department of Sociology Anthropology for the past five years, but now he's sitting there in cold Virginia. And we have Dr. Greg Tangonan there in Perch there in California. So uh, these two distinguished speakers are, have long experience in studying, implementing, and analyzing systems. And where does their scientific and technological inputs come in? So also we are quite fortunate that we our panel of reactors also come from a very rich intellectual backgrounds. So for example, Justin C that Tony cited earlier has just finished her writing his dissertation on uh, just transition in Iloilo on the local and the resettlement sites. Um, he was working with us in the, doing the trust networks. Actually, Tony, remember, uh, Justine and I worked with Emoy Rodolfo and Celine in doing the trust network survey in post Hayan Eastern Samar. We also did the trust network survey in Kamanava and other places. So. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Armando Migs Canela, who is part of the pool of experts of SICAR. Uh, he's a Balik scientist who is with the UP Archaeological Studies Program. We're extremely also, I'm really happy that, you know, Dean Banjo and uh, Dean um, Nandi, you know, for, you know, when I asked them, can you come and comment on what we are working? And they generously said yes so thank you very much dean banjo for you know honoring us and uh, working with us dean banjo and dean nandi has been our major supporters as deans of soci and uh, school of sciences social sciences i don't think i'll be able to do the work in sikar without the support of these people so thank you very much as i would say innovation collaboration and navigation are very important in SICAR. I always tell the scientists, I remember when we were meeting in the earlier parts of 2018, I always tell them, in C to innovate is to collaborate. But to innovate is also to navigate systems. Why is this important? Because to do transitive action work, you have to deal with many sectors you have to deal with many specialists specializing on their own. So I told them that, you know, we have to be intellectually sensitive. We must have intellectual humility and generosity in such a way that we are sensitive to the organizational systems, the organizational commitments and programs of the different partners that we have and their institutional positioning and their institutional dreams and goals. So if you are sensitive to that, then I think we can work together. I always think that to work together productively, we must also be respectful and cognizant of the other's capacities, uh, insights and all. So. I think there's enough homily already for this morning. So I'd say uh, welcome to this webinar and let us enjoy the wisdom of our keynote speakers and our panel of reactors. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Emma. Uh, now we welcome our first keynote speaker, Dr. William E. Reynolds. Dr. Reynolds is an anthropologist and a retired USAID service officer foreign service officer. Dr. Reynolds also taught in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology as a visiting professor. So with his lecture entitled, The Use of Influence Diagrams in Qualitative Systems Analysis of Social Cultural Systems, let us welcome Dr. Bill Reynolds. I guess I'm on. I, I wanna thank, first of all, Dr. Emma Perio for inviting me to this webinar. It's something that I have thought about in terms of sociocultural systems for a long time, as you will notice in some of the references. 
but it's also something that I've applied in all my professional development probably for the last 40 plus years in terms of being either explicit or implicit in terms of doing qualitative systems analysis. So what I'd like to go through today is basically how to put together what I consider to be a very powerful kind of influence diagram that will change through time and allows people, allows everyone to see how you're thinking about a, how a system works. It's a visual approach. And for that reason, it communicates a lot of information. So let me begin with where I start. I've got a few PowerPoints about starting halfway through. But to begin with, human systems are open. Human systems are always unbounded. You have to remember that. Change in human systems is inevitable. Systems adapt to environmental changes and in changing environment, this has become a continuous process. You never stop changing. The focus is on the management of systems and to the extent possible, the management of change in these systems. In human systems, we are confronted with problem situations which comprise a system of problems rather than a collection of problems. Problems are embedded in uncertainty and require subjective interpretation. It is subjective because you see a social situation as a problem, as a problem and you determine that it needs to be solved. To a great extent, problems are developed based on your own experience in terms of your professional expertise, where you live and what you're involved with. Every problem is related to every other problem. Each apparent solution to a problem may aggravate or interfere with others. None of these problems may be tackled using linear or sequential methods. In other words, it's always changing and you have to be ready to accept that as a basic given when you do a systems analysis. But most important, I think in all of this, is that you always have to include those who are affected by the problem in the analysis, analysis in some way, shape, or another, either as consultants, focus group meetings, anything like that, but they have to be involved in this so they take ownership of the problem solution. Social problems are inherently complex problems. Thus, every solution of a complex problem is tentative and incomplete, and it changes as we move toward the solution. As the solution changes, as it is elaborated, so does our understanding of the problem. When you begin with a problem and you think you understand it, and when you end with the solution, you probably have a very different perspective on what that problem was. Anyway, System design requires a continuous recursive interaction between the initial phase of the trigger of the design, i.e. when you come up with a problem, and the final state when the design is completed or when you think your problem is solved or it's ready to go on to the next stage. Qualitative systems method methodology is a learning system which uses systems ideas to formulate mental acts of four kinds. This is important perceiving, predicting, comparing, and deciding for action. It is a learning which leads to a decision to take certain actions, knowing that this will lead to a change situation and new learning, and hopefully the problem being solved. So prior to the emergence of an open system design that we've been talking about so far, the improvement approach to systems change reduced the problem to manageable pieces and sought solutions to each. In other words, they were individual little pieces. Systems design seeks to understand a problem solution as a system of interconnected, interdependent, and interacting solution ideas. There is a question now of what is systems analysis in social science? And this is sort of my own interpretation based on the number of years that I've done this. Quote unquote, it is the understanding of causal relationships between variables that are defined in the context of a social situation that needs to be addressed. Let me go through that again. It is the understanding of causal relationships 
between variables that are defined in the context of a social situation that needs to be addressed. Take an example from going to church. This is a very introductory type of thing, but it gives you the idea of what we have, what we're facing. Going to church, what kind of activity is this? That's a question. How do we analyze it? Well, first of all, it's an economic activity. It's a day of rest. People aren't working. It's also the amount of money they put on the offering plate. So therefore, it's an economic activity on any both levels. It's a social activity. You see others, you see friends. You may, depending on if it's a holiday, impress others with your new clothes, meet others, meet others after the service to talk, talk to others, to gossip, to do whatever. Even where you sit in the church is a social activity in terms of whether you sit in the front or whether you sit in the back or whether you sit in the middle. It's a religious activity. You go to a church to worship God. There's also rituals that are involved with this. It's a geographic activity. In other words, where is the church physically located in the city that you're living in? That's a, all of these are important in terms of trying to understand what going to church is. And importantly, these are all correct descriptions of how you, quote, look at the behavior of going to church. They're all important, yet they're all interconnected. Therefore, how do we integrate all these activities into how we, quote, unquote, analyze human behavior? The answer to this question is the use of systems dynamics or what's called causal inference models. Systems dynamics or causal inference models will help understand how variables interact in a given social situations and how these variables in their interaction produce change in the social system. But before we get into this, but first we have to set some ground rules for operationalizing a causal inference approach. And these are ground rules that were developed that will help you produce a model like you see right here in front of you, the, the feedback model. First, the framework should provide a rational basis for organizing information relating to different aspects of the cultural social system under consideration. Second, the framework should provide a structure for analyzing, visualizing, and communicating about the interactions between different aspects of the human situations. I think of all the things that are important in systems analysis, one of the more primary ones is the fact that it's visual. You're actually seeing how somebody sees the solution and the interrelationships of variables to a given problem. And because it's visual, other people can look at this and understand how the originator thought. And they say to each other, well, you know, I agree with that feedback, but why don't we change it a little bit to do this? It's an iterative process, but it's visual. And therefore the communication is so much more intense and so much more complete. And this, this is what I found in my own experience of doing this over the years is that quote unquote, a picture is worth a thousand words. Going on, <clears throat> third, the framework should con encourage consideration of the full spectrum of variables which may be relevant. And I've got relevant in bold print in any particular situation under investigation. It should ensure that full consideration be given not only to the variables of a tangible and easily quant quantifiable kind, but also to psychosocial variables of an intangible aspect of reality. We'll be talking about what is relevant in terms of doing a causal inference model in a few minutes because that is one of the key things to get out of this is how do you determine something is relevant? And fourth, the framework must encourage consideration of changes over time in the system under investigation, as well as a sense of perspective with respect to rates of change and the scale of social activities and impacts. In other words, the model that you see on the screen is to a certain extent, a structural functionalist model. There's structure to it, 
and it's functional. You see the interactions, but it's based on the fact that this changes through time. These are feedbacks. It's not static. It's always changing. It's two dimensional. It'd be nice if we could think of in terms of three dimensional models, but I can't and certainly can't draw one. So you're stuck with what you see on the screen. Anyway, the fifth one is the framework must be flexible. This is to say, while it must be useful in the organization of information and communication, it should also encourage speculation and the formulation of new ideas. It must never dictate our way of thinking about the human situation. This is the framework that we need to work within to develop a systems dynamic or causal inference model. And go on, <clears throat> a causal inference model is composed of the following. And here we're actually getting into some of the nitty gritty of this. The first are the components. This is just another word for variables and I'll be using the term variables. Let's, can we go back to the previous slide? Perfect, just leave it, leave it. Let's, I'm gonna be talking about this one in a few minutes, thank you. Um, reason I'm doing that is that it's much easier for Ina to move the slides than for me to try to do it over here. So we'll communicate as part of our channel. Components, like getting serious again, are what are the variables? And I'll be using the term variables for the rest of this talk. The variables in this one are the various things that you see connected by the arrows. Channels, channels are the means of interaction. They can be information or they can be physical but you always have to have them and you always have to know what kind of a channel you're dealing with. Feedback, is it positive or negative relationships? And I'll be talking about this in a few minutes. Networks, networks are relationships of variables via channels for a specific investigation. And I'll be giving an, an example of a network in terms of a more complex model in a few minutes so you can get an idea of the difference between a model like this and a subsection of it that actually is formed by a network. And then lastly, change, which is the effect of deviation amplifying or deviation counteracting feedback. Feedback is always deviation amplifying or it's deviation counteracting. And again, we'll be getting to that into great gory detail in just a minute. Question is, how do we do all this? The step Step one is to identify the problem. And based on listening to everybody talk before this started and my own experience is that we all know how to identify problems. That's part of our expertise. This is based on your professional experience. You know what problems are important. You know what problems are not quite so important and ones that you don't even wanna deal with. So identification of the problem is not too complex. I mean, it's based on your professional experience. However, the second step is the identity, identifying the variables. These are what you want to look at in terms of solving the problem. You have to describe how they relate to the problem. Much of this will be based again on your professional experience in talking with your colleagues. Variables in any kind of a causal inference model are not natural. There's something that you select based on some criteria. And we'll be talking about this a little bit. The third step is to identify the relationships of the variables in terms of how they relate to solving the problem. How and why the, are the variables relevant to solving the problem? Much of this will also be based on your professional experience and talking with colleagues. What this is coming back to and what you hear in my little talk so far is your professional experience. Your professional experience drives a lot of what you're doing in terms of putting together a causal inference model. It may be a new way of thinking about what you're involved with, but the bottom line is you know best what's going on. Let's discuss these in a little bit more detail. Problems are developed and identified in terms of the need to find a solution to a social system situation. The next step of identifying the variables in terms of solving the problems is key to the solution to the problem. How does one choose the variables to focus on to solve the problem? This is the process of the third step, identifying the relationships of the variables. To answer this, 
The answer to this is talking about the variables in terms of the following aspects of information. And this is something that I'm gonna go over that is a little way, is a little new to looking at how you define the variables explicitly in a feedback model, a causal inference model. Because what I'm gonna be talking about demands that you become very explicit in how you're thinking about this. First of all, you define the variables in terms of their classificational definition. Exactly what is the variable? Is it tangible or intangible? How do you distinguish it from other variables in terms of the specific characteristics? In other words, a chair is different than a table. Malnutrition is different than disease. Psychological issues are different than environmental issues, but they all can be defined in terms of their own characteristics. Secondly, once you have developed a variable classification definition, a, cl a variable, de class, excuse me, classificational definition, you then may move to step two, how the variables relate to the other variables. These are, this involves the relational definition. Again, is the interaction tangible or intangible? This relationship is based upon the feedback between the variables. You have to determine if the relationship is causal or if it's coincidental, because relationships can be both kinds, both causal or just a function of coincidence. What you have to do in terms of your professional expertise is determine if the relationship is causal because relationships are the result of coincidence, you can drop them, they're not important. We are only interested in causal relationships. Relationships are based upon feedback, which will be again, we'll discuss in a second. The third step, and I think is probably the most important step and the one that demands the most rigor of all the steps is it requires you to determine the relevance of the, of the variable to solving the problem. In other words, if this variable was not used, would it make a difference? And if it does make a difference, why and how? One has to determine why the variable is needed to solve the problem. This is the most important step in this process for you really have to know why a variable is important to help you solve the problem that you are considering and confronting. In a real sense, this will be based again on your experience and working with others as you go through this process. But relevance is something that you don't really hear people talking about in terms of how they define variables. They can give you a classificational definition, they can give you a relational definition, but when you start asking people, well, is it really relevant or not? then people have to, the people that you're asking that question to have to really sit down and think, is this variable that important to solving this problem? It may be important, but it's not as important as another variable. So therefore both variables are important, but the intensity of their relevance is different. This is also something that's very critical in systems thinking. These types of information, classificational, relational, and relevant are the what, how, and why of causal inference. As the problem solution is developed, the variables and or their relationships and relevance may change. That's also important that the variables you start with at the beginning, their relationships and their relevance, as you get more experience in terms of looking at your causal inference model, they may change. They're always in a constant state of re-evaluation as you understand more of what's going on. And there is a last step. This is the last step is just as important. It is when is the causal inference model complete? What are the outputs? When is the problem solved? A lot of people don't think about this, but when do you actually consider a problem to be solved? At the beginning of developing a causal inference model, the system is considered closed, i.e. the boundary is fixed. This allows you to become familiar with the variables and their interactions. When, with a grasp of that understanding though, of this basic system, 
It may then be reopened to new variables and relationships that you now deem important as your understanding increases. That's incredibly important, is that you understand your system the more you work with it. In this process, more powerful explanations are developed. There's no question about that. Then it gets better. While you're doing all this, you have to think about boundaries of the system. In other words, what to include in your system and what to exclude. This is also part of the variable definition process we just discussed, the classificational, relational, and relevant. Boundaries in a social system are not rigid or absolute for three reasons. And this also can drive social systems analysis people crazy. First, they are determined by the problem and parameters may fluctuate. Second, there are no natural or objective boundaries or decisions as to boundaries in social systems. There's nothing that says that the model that you see on the screen is the only way you can put that model together. It is the design of the person who wrote this article. Third, in social systems, variable simulation, i.e. something that influences a variable, causes it to change or causes it to vibrate, whatever you want to say, is not a yes or no function, but it's a function of the intensity and degree of stimulus. So all these variables that you see in the model here are not an off and on situation. They're related by the intensity of the interaction in terms of whether it's a positive or negative feedback aspect to it. That's also something that's fairly new and kind of hard to think about, but you've always got to keep in mind um, the intensity and degree of the interaction because it changes through time. That's the other thing. Something can be intense now, and a year later, you say, hey, this isn't as important anymore. It's not as intense, therefore, but it's still important, but not as important. You've got to be able to accommodate that kind of thinking. There is more than one concept to review in developing a causal inference model before we actually look at some examples, and that is feedback. Feedback may be defined as a plus symbol or as a negative symbol. The plus associated with the channel between two variables implies that an increase or decrease of the amount of variable decreases the input respectively. They both increase or decrease in the same direction. A negative indicates that an increase or decrease in the output variable decreases or increases the input variable respectively. And this is the first feedback model that I want to talk about. Thus, in the PowerPoint, the plus means an increase in each variable or a decrease in each variable. In other words, if, a, if it's a plus, both variables are increasing, or it's a negative, both or, or it can also mean, excuse me, a plus, both variables are increasing or both variables are decreasing. A negative means that it's just the inverse. One variable increases and the other variable decreases, or one variable decreases, causing another variable to increase. Let's take a look at this diagram to do it a, a little bit more precisely in terms of the aspect of it. If you go to the top of the diagram, it talks about the number of people in a city. And if you go down to the amount of garbage per area, that's a positive feedback. That means that a, as you increase the number of people in a city, you increase the amount of garbage per area. Then you go down to the next ver, uh, variable, bacteria per area. As the garbage increases, the bacteria per area increases. As the bacteria increases, the number of diseases increase. And then if you go back up to the very top, there's a possibility as the number of diseases increase, the number of pe the people in the city decreases. You'll notice this is a negative associated with this feedback arrow. Therefore, if the number of people in a city decreases, the amount of garbage decreases, the amount of bacteria per area decreases, the amount of number of diseases decreases, and therefore, when you go back up, the number of people in the city may increase. What you're looking at is something that goes on through time. And that's what's so critical about looking at all of this. It's a, it's a feedback that goes through time. If you go to the next model, this is the influence model of a peasant system. And 
what is important here is that this model tries to integrate, if you look at it closely, let me get my own notes out here so I can do that. It integrates a lot of different levels of social interaction. At the very top, you see the word economy, a lot of arrows going into economy. And then if you go down to what would be to the, the right of economy, you see envy. So you're going from economy, which is sort of a very solid concept to envy, which is a very amorphous concept in the same system. And then envy goes down to psychosomatic illness and, and also psychological fears. If you go to the opposite side of the diagram, you see a lot of arrows go to disease. And this is because disease interfaces with a lot of things that happen in a peasant social system and what affects it. And so what's, what's important here is that this model, to give you a little bit of background to it, is one that was based on the ethnographic field work of George Foster. He's an anthropologist that did work in Central America on peasant social systems. I took his ethnographic data and translated it into this influence diagram. This model represent, this model integrates the physical aspects of the environment, social relation factors, psychological factors, and health factors. Each relationship, and this is what all the numbers relate to, each relationship is associated with a positive or negative feedback and a number, and a number, which ties to the relational definition of the two variables and their classification definitions. What I've done in this with each number of, the re of an arrow between two variables is explicitly defined in an appendix to what this relationship is. It's not something that you as somebody who's looking at it has to think about. It's something that I went ahead and defined. And so you could go back into the appendix to this model and say, hey, I agree with Bill or I don't agree with Bill or I think it should be changed a little bit. The other important thing is you can also predict what will happen. Because if you go to one side, it talks about the physical, it talks about the, um, let me find it here in my notes. Talks about the physical environment and there's feedbacks from that. And you can predict if you change the phys physical environment, what's going to happen to different aspects of this systems model. And this is why it's important to understand how complex it is because it talks about not only the physical changes, but if you introduce, for example, new technologies in terms of farming, that's gonna have a long-term effect on envy. It's gonna have a long-term effect on the social relationships of the people. And because this model can integrate this via a systems approach, you can start talking about all of this at one time. And that's why it's so important. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is a more smaller example of a network. And this is one of the networks that's embedded in the model that we just looked at. And this, is, this involves sanitation, immunization, and hygiene, how they affect disease, and then how that's going to affect population, land production, agriculture, and the economy, and malnutrition. So running through this, if you look at sanitation, there's a negative feedback to it. So this would imply that as sanitation is increased, disease is decreased. And as disease is decreased, if you go on negative number 29, population is going to increase. As the population increases, land production may or may not increase. But for sure, if you increase land production, you're going to increase agriculture. That's why it's a positive. If you increase agriculture, you're going to increase the economy. Again, 41 is a positive. Increase the economy, you decrease malnutrition. If you decrease malnutrition, you decrease disease. And that's how this model works. It, it's something that occurs through time. And it's, these networks are smaller parts of that whole system that we saw in the previous slide. 
So in other words, it really means that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts because the whole encompasses a lot more. Can we go to the next slide, please? These are examples of what I call classificational definitions. And this kind of definition is associated with each variable. And instead of me reading it, you can look at it and take an and have an idea of what it actually involves. And a lot of it is out of Foster's work. Keeping in mind, he did this, he did his field work in 1967, but it's just as valid then as it is now. It's just as valid now now as it was then. Agriculture, the bottom one is primarily crops or maize, beans, squash, and wheat. The plowing is done with oxen. The sowing is usually done with a friend, the compadre. Traditionally, the farmers are dependent on rainfall for maturing their crops. With this definition of agriculture, you can then go into the systems and see if any of these change in terms of quote unquote agriculture, what's gonna to happen to the system. And so we can see that in the next slide, please. These are examples of relational definitions. And this is relation number 29. It goes be between disease, it's a negative to population, which means that as disease increases, the population decreases. Or inversely, as disease decreases, population increases. This feedback postulates that an increase in disease may, on the village level, cause a decrease in population of various families. And this is exactly what happens. The reason is that with members of the family sick or weak for an extended period of time, that may not be able to reproduce and eventually die. This assumes that a decrease in the economy prevents the individual from seeking a doctor's help. So all of these things are related just in terms of that little feedback. The next one is malnutrition and disease. And that's also a negative feedback. Increase in malnutrition, that should be, this feedback states that an increase in malnutrition will cause an increase in disease. That should be a positive, that should be a positive number there for biological and physiological reasons. So assuming that it's a positive feedback, an increase in malnutrition is gonna cause an increase in disease and vice versa, a decrease in malnutrition will cause a decrease in disease. So these are examples of relational definitions. I now wanna go into quickly into a model of another type of relational influence diagram. And this is a model of the Konkani of Mountain Province, Philippines resource recycling. This is taken from Dr. Evelyn Caballero's work among the Konkani traditional small scale miners of Benguet province. It shows how all aspects of the gold processing system collect and recycle gold that is not completely processed at each step in the mining of the gold. You can see on the left hand side of this, it's got the three sources of the gold. And then it goes into the three ways of processing it. And it comes together in the center of the diagram into more compact, air, comp, compact areas of what actually is going to happen. And what's important in understanding this model is that at each stage, the amount of the gold that is not processed but gets dispersed or fallen out of the pan or anything like that is recycled in a different manner. But ultimately, none of it is lost. And that's what this model portrays, how everything is related to each other and how it's not lost. And the last model on the next page is an adaptation, what's called an adaptation template. And this is a bit more general model than the one I had for the peasant village, because for example, social effects are links numbers one through two. And you can see it in the center of the diagram. It says social effects, the state of the cultural paradigms, and state of the community. Those are related. Health effects are links one, three, and four. And those are related to each other, where environmental effects are links one, five, and six. And co effects are links three, five, seven, and four. That's how you do an influence diagram. You see three different examples here, but I think the most important idea to get from all of this 
is that influence diagrams are visual. They allow people to see what's going on. They allow you to communicate this to your people that you're working with in terms of everything that you're thinking about. They can look at it. They can talk about it. They can come up with ideas. You can show this to a local community. They can say, hey, that's true or that's not true. You really need to change this variable and you need to change this arrow that relating those two variables. It's very easy to do in terms of showing this to local organizations, local people and say, hey, jump in and help me improve it. And that's basically my little presentation. Um, I know a little Tagalog, so tapus na. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to hearing any questions at the end and Greg's talk, which follows. Thank you very much, Ina, and thank you very much, Dr. Perio. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Uh, now we welcome our um, next speaker, Professor Gregory L. Tangonan. Professor Tangonan is the Emeritus Director of the Ateneo Innovation Center. He also teaches in the Department of Electronics, Computer and Communications Engineering of the Ateneo de Manila University. With his lecture entitled, The Present Normal, Cascading Disasters, let us welcome Professor Greg Tangonan. Hello, everyone. Let me uh, share my, my screen. And then I will play. I hope everyone can see this. Yes, you yes. can. Okay, very good, very good. So we can, we can begin. Thank you all very much for inviting me. This is uh, my dinner time here in uh, South California. And uh, uh, Enjoy uh, having all my my classes uh, in teaching innovation class. Uh, we work with students on on research. Uh, we do complexity systems engineering, information technology, and uh, sometimes we do some real good physics. Uh, it's my it's my pleasure to chat with you about what is uh, what I like to call the present normal. Our present normal is actually that we we live within cascaded disasters. I'll chat with you why we, about why we no longer should ignore these cascaded disasters. We live uh, right now in, 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 in one, uh, a, a number. And I'll talk to you about the, how people uh, understand or begin to, to understand how these cascades uh, happen, how a, how a, how a hazard, once it hits a population or hits an infrastructure, uh, creates a cascade of, of interactions and how that those interactions can actually escalate depending on how people react or how the technologies uh, blend uh, and uh, things can get worse. Uh, in fact, these cascades, oftentimes they escalate our uh, our vulnerability. In fact, it exposes vulnerabilities that we, we hadn't thought about before. Um, I'll give you some real world examples so that so that you, you get a you, you, you get a handle on, on on this systems thinking perspective and we'll talk about Fukushima uh, disaster um, and the, the 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 myths of safety and the breakdown of trust that that, that, that has occurred there. We'll talk about supply chains uh, oftentimes uh, our own group here in, in Ateneo. Uh, we tried to build, we built our own ventilator in response to, to uh, many people uh, looking for ventilators and worldwide there was a ventilator shortage and it's part and parcel of, uh, of a chip shortage, an electronic chip shortage that had started with the, with the pandemic. We'll talk about when water, power and, and connectivity go down, how do we react? That happens over and over. Um, We'll talk about uh, some uh, countries now that are actually building back better, uh, much better actually, but they're using the, the vision uh, and understanding that you get from a system dynamic, uh, uh, holistic viewpoint. And through it all, I, I'll, I'll chat with you about what we do in the Innovation Center with, with the hope of actually coming up with holistic solutions to some, some of these very wicked problems. So let's uh, uh, 
look at the result of a paper that's a wonderful paper, why we can no longer ignore consecutive disasters by uh, Dr. Reuter, Reuter uh, from the Institute of Environmental Studies in, in the Netherlands. So shown here is her figure four, which is Zambales of all, of all things. I was so surprised to see it. But I was also very intrigued. If you look at this timeline, so the, in, the, in the blue are the typhoons, in the red are the earthquakes, in the light blue are the flooding, and in the brown is we have the volcanic eruption. So, and I also included Ondoy in there. So you look and, and, and see that there's waves of, 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 of typhoons that they, they've been, uh, they experienced over these three decades. And there are times when in fact, like uh, 1991, the Mount Pinatubo eruption, that, that we had spectacular uh, uh, coincidences, if you wanna call it that, um, with the passage of Typhoon Yunya and uh, tr triggering a, a lahar and, 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 and flooding. So you can see that over time, we, we've, in, if you look almost any time, we always have a series of, of uh, uh, disasters uh, hitting, hitting the area. But let me add and decorate this picture with something else. So I show now in around 1992, the, the US bases left, left the area. This is Zimbales is, is, is close, okay? There was an Asian financial crisis. There was a great recession around 2008 and Intel left the Philippines and there's 3000 jobs that, would, that, that went away at least. That, that's those are the direct jobs. So you see if, in, if you look at it this way, these are a series of hits that we, we, we took during that decade. And we should really understand what happens to, to the, the a people that's got hit that, that hard that often. I invite you to think about your own timeline. In the last two years, if you drew your own timeline, I wouldn't be surprised that you have something very rich in, in, uh, in different kinds of uh, uh, ways in which you had to cope with uh, uh, some kind of disaster. Um, this is a, Reuters paper actually looks at the way of understanding if you had just single hazard and they don't interact, then, then you have, for instance, an earthquake and then there's a recovery. And then there's something else and then there's a recovery. So these, these hazards do not interact. And, and you can make simple models of how you re respond to one of these. And you may even try to define resilience in this kind of context. But the, the reality is that we, have, we are not, we don't have the luxury of just saying, um, well, I'll only handle single hazards where, where, this, where the system actually allows you to recover. In reality, we see oftentimes earthquake followed by a typhoon. And then we see some kind of dependent recovery. It depends on the order, it depends on the magnitude, it depends on the time. And uh, if, you, if, you, if we want to plot here, as opposed to the, the quality of the built infrastructure, well, the, the number of casualties depend on, on the, the, the details of, of when, when it hit and, and, and how. If you look at uh, in, in, the, in the far right here, you have consecutive disasters like an earthquake uh, and followed by a meltdown like in, like in Fukushima. And, and then later on, there's more flooding, there's more landslide. A lot of this typifies what happens in, in, uh, happened in, in Japan. But every day, if you look at, uh, at, at the news, you can see that these cascades uh, are very real. In Southern California and Australia, we have a heat wave, and then all of a sudden, there's some very, very strong winds, and the strong winds actually knock down the power poles, and then there are wildflowers, fires, and driven by the, by the heavy winds, and then you have massive disruptions, you know, half a million uh, acres. And then later on in time, uh, there's heavy rains and then there's flooding and there's landslides. So this is what these cascades look like. They're very real. And you, you, can, you should wonder what happens to a, a, a people that actually gets hit like this. Remember, if, if you're in, in Casiguran uh, uh, and, or Baler, you're hit by, by these, these uh, disasters all the time, the typhoons all the time. 
and, and so I remember when I was in working in the, in, in the, in the Senate um, that when Ondoy hit and there was a relief, uh, massive relief for Ondoy, uh, the people from, from Baler were saying, wait, 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 well, we, we have a backlog of things we haven't even fixed. And here you are with this new money, you're gonna put it here in, 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 in Metro Manila. So that this, we have to really understand that. No? That there is a backlog of, of, of these effects. So uh, um, it looks like an in, a very powerful institute in University of, uh, College London, the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Uh, they published two very very nice papers that that try to uh, help us understand how these cascades work, and I, I really like the, what they've done, done because. They talk about causes, the, the, so a hazard will, is, is a cause, and they talk about effects, and they talk about escalation. So uh, you could have a, a, a hazard, and then, and then it has these immediate effects and effects, and then later on, this comes a point, there comes a point that, uh, that somebody makes a decision or something happens, some interaction happens, and that could make things even worse. So um, let, me, let me give you an example. Let's say we have in the pandemic, you decide early in the pandemic, you decide we're gonna have a lockdown, but your lockdown design requires that people over 65 years old, like me, I'm over 70, okay? You have to stay home, you can't do anything. Okay, so that's, one, that, that's certainly one model. Okay, I mean, because you need to be protected, you shouldn't be able to go around. The California model or the US model is, oh, oh these people can, 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 can go around. They can, I can drive to Whole Foods every day if I want, as long as I take all the precautions. And then when my time comes to get the, the vaccine, uh, I'll go on. So, so depending on what you decide, you will have different uh, effects and you may have down, 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 the, line, down the line consequences uh, that, that, you have to, that, that you'll have to reckon with. Uh, if, you met, if you look, recently the J&J &J vaccine halted. So the, uh, the, in, in the European Union, the, 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 their, their version of the uh, FDA there decided to halt because they have six or seven cases of, the, of, of, uh, of clotting. Similarly, uh, in the US, they had the clot. In the, the words are in abundance of caution. Okay. So you can say that that's a, that's, that's a good intervention or you could actually say, well, wait, wait a second. It actually only feeds the, the, the people who, who are reluctant to take the vaccine. So, you, so what I like about this model is that these cascades are happening, but every once in a while, you see that there are points where the, the, there's a nonlinear escalation. Uh, and that's, that's, that's very interesting. So let's talk about Fukushima, okay? So I have a wonderful book that I just got. Uh, it's uh, a couple of weeks old. That's that's whenever there's somebody at my front door, my my ring device will will, will tell me. So, um, so there's a wonderful book. It just came out of I think about a month ago, and I have it. It, it and uh, 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 Yoichi Funabashi uh, is a very well respected journalist in, in in Japan, and he made many many interviews with the plant operators military personnel, government officials. And he has kind of the inside scoop directly from the participants. So let's, let's, let's look at it, okay? I re realize that I'm not talking about all the, all the whole thing. We're just talking about the, uh, at the reactor, but certainly we, we recognize that the, the uh, magnitude nine earthquake killed a hundred people. Uh, the tsunami killed over 2,000 and probably about 3,000 still missing. So those were quite, quite, quite uh, uh, destructive uh, events. But if you look at from, from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, of the, the, the model that we're, we've been talking about, so H1 is the, is, the, is the earthquake. The effect one is that the immediate scramble of the, of the, of the reactor. They drop the, the control rods in to, to quench the, the, the radioactive uh, uh, um, heating of the, of the water in this water reactor. 
uh, the, the effect of the earthquake was also to cut the power lines into the reactor. So there's no power going in. In about an hour, or less than an hour, uh, several waves of uh, more than 10 meters uh, of, of tsunami came in. The effect of, of that was that the site flooded. All reactors in the, in the lower chambers of, of that flooded, and also the backup generators went out, and also the DC power went out. The important vulnerability that you want to realize is that and everybody knows that after you scramble, you better keep the water in the reactor above covering the, the, the fuel rods. Otherwise, this, this, the, the, the water will actually boil and build up pressure and you will expose the, 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 the fuel rods and there'll be a fire and an explosion. In this timeline, which was very interesting, at, at that point when the AC and DC power went out, the main plant managers realized that they had never trained for this scenario. Whenever they did training, an outage of a DC and AC power was never foreseen. In fact, it was unimaginable in their context, which is to me really quite amazing. So when they did uh, practice, they would kill the AC, the AC power but they would never kill the DC power. And they would actually, whenever they did the thing, they remembered that they were told to freeze. No, we never turn off the DC power, which is really uh, 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 shocking. So the Fukushima disaster is actually looks like at the very beginning, you, there, were big, there was a chain of failures in preparation and decision-making. Moreover, uh, the analysis shows that, in fact, you know, there is a trap of uh, the myth of absolute uh, uh, safety, uh, a failure of, of the, the regulator agencies like regulatory capture, you know, and an interesting thing called the Galapagosization of safety rules. What that means is that the, the Japanese were allowed to evolve their own way of calling the, the reactor safe. Okay, so their own species, so to speak, their own ways of, of, of adapting. And then there was a, a, a ambiguity in national policy and the lack of leadership. So this is really uh, uh, quite an amazing revelation of how, of how um, at particular points, danger can escalate. So the long-term consequences are that uh, the, it looks as if the, 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 the evacuation has probably caused more uh, harm than, than, than anticipated. Um, there, there's been a long exile, not even half of the people of the 60,000 plus have returned. Um, and many are elderly and wondering when they're going to go back. The cleanup hasn't been, been uh, completed. And I think most of all, we, we have to really understand what it takes, what happens when uh, there's a breakdown of trust in the government, in the nuclear industry. What happens to a, a, a people, a fragile a population, when there is actually a cascade of trauma? I, I don't think we, 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 we know and appreciate uh, what's going on, but I think we will see cascades of trauma all over because of our pandemic. Oops, here, okay. So let me just uh, switch to a different topic, which is supply chains. Let's say if I wanted to build a, a ventilator, I, I, I call up, a, or I wanted to buy a ventilator, uh, I call up a ventilator supplier and the ventilator supplier will tell, oh yeah, I can have one for you in a couple of weeks. Well, how does he get it? He actually gets all of the piece parts from suppliers, from raw materials, so subcontractors, and they're sent over, let's say it's made in Malaysia. Uh, a subcontractor in the Philippines who would have actually participate, put it together, and then they would integrate it, and then they would ship it over there. And all of this is done just in time. Uh, most, of the, most of the logistics that we do is just in time. The parts just arrive so that I don't have to have an inventory. Uh, it's globally coordinated, and, and I can just 
In fact, if I buy something from Apple here, I can watch it. I can see when it's when it's shipping, where it is, and all that. Uh, but I don't see the back end of how many how many displays they had to use and 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 put together or the chips. Um, but all of this the works really well, and 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 most of us don't realize that this is all that's just in time, and that we have we get this low cost from this just in time production. But when there's a disaster, all hell breaks loose. You can't find a dis you can't find a ventilator. You can't find chips. You can't find any many other things. In fact, today we have a, a crisis in computer chips, uh, and you can't make ventilators without the without the, the computer chips. But but here's how it went. Okay, so when the pandemic hit, by the way, the, the Anchor and Ionics are Filipino companies who are actually in shutdown because of because of the because of the pandemic. So uh, when the pandemic hit. Everybody who's in production had to slow down and try to figure out what are we going to do? Can we go in the half? I think maybe uh, Anchor and Ionix went down the half because uh, demand was supposedly going down. The car manufacturers said, oh my gosh, we don't probably won't be selling anything. So let's cut back on, on, on the number of cars we're going to make. But over time, in fact, we realized that the, the, the need for computers, because everybody was staying home, everybody was going to get a 5G phone that there was a peak in the interest in appliances and so the the it, it came back up and, and so but very quickly we realized that hey the we, we don't have enough chips and what was happening was that companies like huawei who's actually um anticipating that there might be some kind of sanction against them for for a, a completely different reason had been buying up all the chips so that they, they wouldn't be hit by an embargo. So while the, the demand was up, there was a big pressure to bring the, the, bring the production up. But at the same time, there was a cold snap in Texas, climate change, a fire, that's, this, uh, that's not climate change. But what's most interesting is that at Taiwan, TSMC is the world premier uh, chip maker, is trying to ramp up their, their, their production at the same time that they have a, a, a utter lack of water. Make the chips, you need distilled water. And right now Taiwan has, is in a drought. So much so that farmers are now rash, getting rations of, wa of water so that TSMC can stay in business. So this is how the supply chain is brought to its knees. And, and it's, it's a very important that we, we, we see this because we, we will see this over and over again unless we try to figure out what, what, what is our position in Anchor and Ionics with respect to this kind of, uh, of, of possible uh, breakup in the supply chain. There are a number of people wanting to come to the Philippines precisely because we may not have those, that, the, that level of, the, uh, of disasters like they had in, in Thailand. So I, gave, I hope you get an example that the complicated looking uh, diagram actually fits within within this kind of uh, uh, scenario. Uh, during this time, uh, I'm very happy to, to, to say that the, the Ateneo, Ateneo team in the AIC was able to build our own uh, 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 ventilator. And uh, the guys really used, uh, they were going to hardware stores, scavenging things, but we really do have something, a medical grade uh, 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 ventilator. But because we have, we're systems thinkers, uh, we we actually added uh, a technology that's not in the in the in the low cost uh, ventilators now. We have a way of storing all the transactions that, uh, between the patient and the doctor, the nurses, in in what we call the near cloud. And we also can look at all the data and try to learn from that data using AI and machine learning. This is done during the uh, during a pandemic so I, I, I kudos to our AIC guys so going back to the uh, again logistics from a very different point of view we must think about how we feed a city and here I show you here uh, urban aquaponics this is where you grow the fish you raise the fish and the vegetables and they have uh, some uh, very nice symbiotic uh, uh, way so you have a vegetable plus the protein self-sufficiency. 
real good question is, can you, can you take this kind of approach to scale? Um, these approaches do use far less water than, than normally hydroponics that can use that much water. And there may be other technologies that uh, we need to, to pull this off. But I'm really happy to see that we have these pop-up free um, uh, farmers markets uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, going on. So let me go to my third subject, which, which is uh, uh, the survival during, during the times when in fact there's no power and no water and no, uh, no energy. This comes from, come to us, this data comes to us from our collaborator, Toyota Infotech Center and the TTC Japan. So we've had a, a long-term uh, relationship with them developing new technologies for disasters uh, and involving cars. Plotted here is the, is the survival rate as a function of time. You can see that the survival rate drops to 20 to 30%. This is actual data from, from, from the great East, in Jap East Japan uh, earthquake, okay? Um, so this is not a, a, a model data, but it actually shows you uh, what, 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 what they were up against. At 30, 72, minute, 72 hours, you're down to, you're down to uh, 20 to 30% uh, survival. So for a long period, long before uh, the, the rescue is actually there and, and in effect, there's very little uh, uh, surviving, uh, uh, survivors are, are losing the opportunity to, 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 to succeed. And then surely when, when they come in, you see a peak, but that's already down in the, in, in the area where in fact your, your chances of survival are, are already really low. This happens over and over again. It, this is uh, good data from, 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 from Japan, but you can envisage, in fact, and you can understand that in some places in, in the Philippines and, and Indonesia and other places, that this period where you're really on your own is, uh, can be weeks. So let me show you something that we did during Glenda. Now remember, if you might recall that uh, Typhoon Glenda it, it actually just had a glancing a blow on Metro Manila. But what happened was that the flooding was so, in a sense, kind of strategic, but the winds were so strong that very quickly, if you look over here, the, the, the channel availability. So this is now the, the number of channels that all the base stations, like the, let's say there's about 5,000 base stations in, in Metro Manila area. We were had an opportunity through one of our students who was doing a master's, and we actually got to see the channel availability dive in a matter of hours, down to to down so that almost half of the of the uh, more than half of of the of the base stations were not working. In other words, no one was communicating, and that this situation lasted for almost three weeks. Let me just show you a slight anim uh, an animation of, uh, of the data that we had. So this is a master's degree done by one of the, of the ECE students. Okay, so you, the blue means everything is copacetic. Now you see the red, these guys are suboptimal if not completely off. And it lasts for a while. It takes a while and the reason is power. The base station is supposed to have eight hours worth of backup power, but you notice that your base stations on top of apartment buildings and top uh, whatever, and I, I'd be surprised they had even two hours worth of, uh, of backup power. So once uh, the, the, the winds come up, sometimes even the power company will shut down their, their, their transformers so that they're not, nothing blows up and then they can, they can bring it back. But the, but the point is that just when we need to communicate, we have no way of communicating. And that from a systems point of view is, is really uh, uh, terrible. And yet it happens over and over again. So what does it mean? It means that we, we wind up with recurring questions like, where's my family? Uh, did the kids get to get evacuated in the, this, lady from Indonesia is saying, I got a picture of my grandson. Uh, can you find him? 
when is the food coming? So these questions occur over and over again. So the system challenge then is, can we preposition some kind of information, communication assets that we use in everyday life that survive whatever and, and, and will give us this vital pieces of information that we can, we can work on? So this is what we've actually done in, in AIC. We have what's called a mobile cloud, a V-Hub. It's got, uh, uh, it's got Wi-Fi. It can be run off a, a really small battery. Uh, it stays up, but it's got two terabytes of information. We store maps and others, and we can actually execute, and I won't go into the details. Uh, we can actually help reunite families because we can do facial recognition or social contact. And we can actually assist in the, in the search, or we can make sure that, um, Elderly people, myself, when, like myself, when we wind up in an evacuation center, we already have the medicines that they need. We've actually deployed the, the near cloud in a number of places. Uh, the most recent, uh, some of you guys, the, we are deploying it in schools. We have a full uh, STEM uh, coursework. It's a digital library and you can interact. You have Khan Academy, you have uh, simulations of, of, of other things. And we're de we've deployed the, these systems so that you could actually experience the internet without having to pay for the internet. Uh, because you have two terabytes of information already stored. You've cached the information ahead of time. So lastly, uh, I'd like to, to, to mention that in fact, there are a number of cities who are approaching the post pandemic uh, planning you realize that uh, just recently they, they uh, in Europe, they're, they're saying, if you're already vaccinated and you come from the US, come on down because we want to build our tourism back. So all over the world, and you can see uh, Barcelona is now thinking of getting rid of a lot of the cars in downtown uh, Barcelona and reclaiming city space, getting rid of parked cars. In Freetown in Sierra Leone, they've realized that they need to have uh, rain catchers. And so they're putting many, many rain catchers all, all over Sierra Leone and, and actually uh, planting trees. Uh, Amsterdam, surprise, surprise, is uh, because there was no traffic there. They are considering closing the red light area downtown and going all electric downtown. So we and, and AIC uh, uh, built a smart uh, together with smart and PLT a 5G testbed for for a smart city. So we had a 5G connectivity, but we had our drones, and we actually have a live feed of of, uh, of people from from the from the soccer field. At the same time, we had we put the the our near cloud on the on the electric vehicles in there, and students and others were able to enjoy. Um, uh, downloads and, uh, and enjoy uh, data while they're actually, um, um, or movies or something, while they're, while they're traveling. So I, I hope that, that uh, I've, I've told you about uh, um, and convinced you that in fact, it's undeniable that we've been hit with cascaded disasters and that the cascaded disasters in a, in, a, in a very intriguing way, actually reveal kind of a geography of vulnerability. Um, so it helps us redefine what we mean by resilience and risk, but we actually need to embrace the full complexity of what's going on. Um, and systems thinking, I think, uh, uh, our version that we talked about there and what, what Bill just got through talking about, it's no longer optional, guys. Uh, and we need to, to, to prepare ourselves because building back better will actually require us to come up with bold plans that are fashioned by systems thinking. Thank you very much for your kind attention and please keep on innovating. Thank you very much, Dr. Greg. Thank you very much, very much to our guest speakers today. For, for this next session, I would like to call back Dr. Emma Porio to moderate and introduce our panel of reactors. Thank you very much, Ina. Um, I hope you enjoyed the excellent presentations of our distinguished keynote speakers. I enjoyed very much uh, the elucidation by Dr. Reynolds and, of course, uh, Greg. They are really very good in explaining to us 
what seemingly is a complex model and how it's useful to our everyday life and also in our decisions and actions in our institutions. So thank you very much. Um, to start with, our panel of uh, reactors, we'll, have, we'll hear from Mr. Justin Charles C. a recording because he's teaching right now environmental anthropology in La Trobe. Um, then we will it will be followed by um, Dr. Fernando Aldaba, who is also right now attending a Dean's Council and Internationalization Program meeting, very important for our SDGs. And then we'll have um, the, uh, the reaction of Dr. Uh, Banjo Bautista. She had she texted me that she had to leave for her 10 o'clock class. So I said, thank you very much. Um, Doc, Dean Banjo is a very keen supporter of the transdisciplinary work of CCAR PH with, NR, with the NRC. Uh, then our last will be Dr. Migs Canilao, who is part of the pool of panel of experts, who will basically uh, uh, comment on the presentations us, you know, environmental anthropologists, archaeologists, and also um, Migs Ganilau was working in his dissertation on really very important geophysical and social interactions in, her, in everyday life. I'll not talk to you, but I'll tell Migs about it, okay? Um, Ina, can you take over, please? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Tangonan, for your very insightful and important presentation on why we need systems thinking to address complex issues that we currently face today, such as that of climate change. I certainly agree that in order to address climate change and to develop sustainable and adaptive strategies for the future, a systems approach linking people, environment, science, and the economy is necessary. Dr. Tangonan is absolutely right. We need to embrace this complexity of our situation. And systems approach is one way that we can engage with these new concepts, methods, and models that bridge several disciplines. Professor Neil Adger at the University of Exeter and his colleagues reviewed a range of responses to climate change and showed how some have actually undermined resilience instead of building it. This failure was related to a narrow framing of the problem and the lack of consideration of the interaction between climate change and a range of other stressors, such as ecological, cultural, and socioeconomic processes, the many institutions involved in responses, as well as the failure to recognize the dynamic positive and negative feedbacks that Dr. Reynolds earlier talked about. Three important concepts come to mind when dealing with a complex issue like climate change. Context, holism, and scale. First, context. Social and historical context influence the distribution of resources and power within and between societies. And they also shape the institutions in which responses to climate change are made. The case studies presented by Dr. Reynolds utilizing influence diagrams in analyzing the sociocultural system of communities in the Philippines is a case in point while sociocultural meanings, political institutions, and personal relations are difficult to model and to quantify in the same way as, say, precipitation or temperature, they strongly influence human action and therefore need to be thoroughly understood and investigated with equal precision. Second, holism. Holism views systems as entities with interacting parts rather than as sets or assemblages of their own components. It directs our attention to processes of interactions among these parts. In a similar way, focusing on climate change to the exclusion and isolation from other social, political, cultural, and economic processes that shape landscapes and livelihoods is certainly problematic. Finally, scale. Scale takes us from the individual level of human environmental interaction to the community regional, national, and even global domains in both spatial and temporal dimensions. Dr. Porio and Ma'am Tony constantly remind us to think about the connections between local and global processes. 
how global processes affect local contexts and vice versa. In conclusion, we need these three things, context, holism, and scale, context-specific, holistic, and multi-scalar approaches are necessary to address a wicked problem like climate change. Systems thinking and collaborating with others in several disciplines are certainly necessary to come up with what Dr. Tangonan said a while ago, bold plans, those which defy the traditional, simple, linear, and easy solutions. Thank you. Thank you to Sir Justin. No? Uh, Thank you for reminding us of the three most important elements of the systems thinking in light of climate change, context, holism, and scale. So our, the, up next in the panel of reactors is um, the Dean of the School of Social Sciences, Dr. Fernando T. Aldaba. He's also a professor of economics at the um, Atene de Manila University. So let us now listen to his video. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to be a discussant in this very interesting webinar. Thank you also, Dr. Reynolds and Professor Tangonan for your insightful talks. Let me go straight to my discussion points. First, our citizens are confronted by a variety of risks every day in their lives. And in the talk of Professor Tangonan about cascading disasters, we have all seen this. A lot of risks, uncertainties, and vulnerabilities confronted by our citizens. Secondly, given all such risks and vulnerabilities, our response should be systemic and integrated. And this is what is called adaptive social protection. One of my research areas is social protection, and I'm happy to share with you quickly the concept of adaptive social protection in my discussion later on. Thirdly, for adaptive social protection to succeed, multi-stakeholder collaboration is needed. Dr. Reynolds' talk on influence diagrams will be an important tool for this to be achieved. So let me now quickly show you the various social risks and vulnerabilities our citizens confront in their lives. Individual life cycle risks like hunger, illness, old age. Economic risks like underemployment, uh, low income, and economic crisis. Environmental and natural hazards like typhoons, drought, floods volcanic eruption, and even the current pandemic, which is a natural health hazard or risk. And political and governance risks like armed conflicts, corruption, social exclusion, and even discrimination. The biggest government response is the implementation of social protection programs. And this would include uh, labor market interventions like livelihood programs and active labor market programs implemented by the Department of Labor and Employment, social insurance like PhilHealth, social assistance like the Pantawid Familia Filipino implemented by the DSWD, micro and airway schemes, microfinance and microinsurance programs uh, supported by government like the DTI, child protection programs um, implemented by the DSWD. So these are all kinds of social protection programs. But what seemed to be missing? If you notice, there seemed to be not much response to environmental risks and natural hazards. But as you see on your screen, there are actually two significant responses to this. And these are disaster risk reduction and management, which is DRR in short. And these are uh, policies and programs that try to uh, reduce vulnerabilities and hazards and also uh, the impacts of disasters in the overall framework of sustainable development. 
And the second is the climate change adaptation. These are policies and programs which try to uh, adapt to the negative impact of climate change. But if you want to have a more integrated and systemic response, we need to combine the three. Researchers and practitioners call this adaptive social protection, as you see on your screen. Social protection, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation actually have commonalities. They all take multi-sectoral and integrated approaches to uh, confronting risks. They also aim to uh, make individuals and communities resilient and adaptive to, uh, to changes in their environment. And lastly, all of them are components of inclusive development strategies and poverty reduction programs in developing economies. So adaptive social protection is uh, a more integrated approach and, in a, and a, a useful framework to shield our citizens from the variety of risks and vulnerabilities they face in their lives. So let me end uh, this short discussion with the characteristics of adaptive social protection. First, uh, it transforms productive livelihoods so that people become more resilient rather than just coping. Uh, it tackles the structural root causes of poverty for significant sectors so that targeting can be more precise and more effective. It is also characterized by collaborative research from both the natural and social sciences to craft meaningful policies and programs. This is the same uh, strategy of the Coastal Cities at Risk project of Dr. Emma Poria. And lastly, a successful implementation of adaptive social protection needs the collaboration of key sectors and each will need to carry out their significant roles in achieving um, the aims, the goals of uh, adaptive social protection. Thus, in order for us to effectively confront the diverse social risks and vulnerabilities, this integrated approach and framework is really necessary. And it, it actually creatively combines the relevant components and strategies of social protection, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I cannot join you in the open forum, but I know you will all have a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much to Arlene Binandi. Uh, next in our panel is Dr. Evangeline P. Bautista, Associate Professor of the Department of Mathematics and the immediate past lead of the School of Science and Engineering in the Ateneo de Manila University. So we think with, uh, with uh, Sir Justin Binandi and Dr. Bautista, we thank them for preparing and recording their discussions for today. So let us now listen to Dean. The one thing that has always been clear to me is that the world's biggest problems will not be solved by a single discipline. Hunger, climate change, environment, or even COVID-19. Thus, there was a time when I believed that if I can get the physicists, the biologists, the chemists, the environmental scientists, the computer scientists, the mathematicians, and the engineers to work together, then bigger problems will be solved and the impact of research will be greater. But then you realize first things about the people and then about the problem. Let me begin with the people. Number one, not all brilliant minds can work in a team or on an interdisciplinary problem. I may have a scientist with hundreds of publications in his name, but once you take this person out of his or her comfort zone and put him or her in a team working on an interdisciplinary problem, things just do not work. 
Sometimes it is because he cannot see how his area of expertise will work on an interdisciplinary setting as he or she is unable to comprehend the bigger system other than what he or she is used to working on. And sometimes it is just about relationships. The person is just not a team player. Next, even if they can work in a team, it will have to be the right team. Not all combinations will work. Otherwise, you can find yourself spending more time fixing relationships rather than solving scientific problems. Last, in dealing with scientific problems that involve people, you will need the social scientist. The problems may be solved in a lab, but implementation will be something else altogether. Scientists are not the best people to implement their solution in the community. For that, you will need a social scientist to talk to the people, explain the situation, otherwise the solution will be totally wasted and not implemented at all. Moving over to the problem, real-world problems are highly complex and even if you have a strong team of scientists and social scientists working together cohesively, more often than not, you will only be able to contribute a small part to the solution and not give the entire solution. If you want a complex problem solved, you will need a systems thinker who can break down the problem into something similar to Dr. Reynolds' influence diagrams and at the same time factor in the cascades that Dr. Tangonan described in his talk. Next is a more practical consideration and that is the funding. Ten years ago, funding agencies do not know how to handle interdisciplinary projects. We have had the experience of giving what we believed was a very good proposal and we found ourselves being passed on from one agency to another since this part of the problem is not within the scope of just one agency. In the end, we would usually find the proposal broken into small chunks with only one or two chunks being approved for funding. Fortunately, things are changing as our funding agencies have grown to favor research proposals that solve actual existing problems and the discipline becomes secondary. We have funded problems like CICAR PH, which has transcended the normal research project we have in the sense that it is led by a social scientist who is working very productively with natural scientists. We still have a long way to go, but I am hopeful and grateful to people like Dr. Tangonan and Dr. Reynolds whose ideas can lead us to the right path. And most especially, someone like Dr. Porio who can put everything together and may actually be the true systems thinker in the team. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much to Dr. Bautista. Next in our panel is Dr. Michael Armanti Canelao. Dr. Canelao is an Associate Professor of the Archaeological Studies Program of the University of the Philippines, Tileman, and a member of the Pool of Experts of the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines Project. I now hand over the floor to Dr. Migs Canelao. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, how's the audio? Audio is fine. Yes, you. Okay, so I have my notes in another screen. I hope you don't mind. I'm switching between screens. So first, thank you, uh, NRC President Tony, and to Doc Emma for uh, uh, inviting me to be a reactant. Um, now, the influence diagram is a great example of systems thinking in qualitative applications. Cascading networks also is a great way to unravel quantitative connections. Now, transdisciplinarity, mixed methods to use Doc Emma's words, allows us to pursue both in combination. And to further use Doc Emma's you know, word, uh, transdisciplinarity, resilient and inclusive partnerships uh, are key. You know? So uh, not only the private and public, but as we can now see uh, with the two um, uh, talks we uh, listened earlier, the physical and the social sciences, right? Now allow me to take a tack that may seem a, a bit unconnected, but as will be revealed shortly, is pretty much connected. So at this juncture, I would also like to uh, uh, maybe uh, suggest uh, to use Mom Tony's uh, word, you know, we need tools of a system thinker. Now I would like to suggest that perhaps uh, in working closely with uh, 
systems thinking and cascading um, disasters. We can also consider social network analysis or SNA. If I may quote Borgatti and Foster in 2004, um, back in the days when they were envisioning the contribution of SNA to, the, uh, to our uh, uh, lives, um, they said that uh, SNA is part of a general shift toward more relational, contextual, and systemic understandings. Now, there was a landmark um, volume uh, which uh, featured SNA in disaster. Uh, this was uh, released in 2017 by Jones and Paas. And indeed, social network analysis of disaster response, recovery, and adaptation covers systematic social network analysis and how people in, and institutions function in disasters, after disasters, and the ways they adapt to hazard settings. So as hazards become disasters, the opportunities and constraints for maintaining a safe and secure life and livelihood become too strained for many people. So as an anecdote, social interactions exacerbate or mitigate those strains, necessitating a concentrated intellectual effort to understand the variation in how ties within and outside communities respond and are affected by hazard and disaster. So coming from that uh, volume, so uh, just to give you a quick background on SNA, so it's uh, part of the mathematical graph theory, and I had the pleasure of working with uh, one of the pioneers of this approach, Dr. John Edward Terrell uh, at the Field Museum back in the day. And uh, now it has uh, really uh, spread around uh, different disciplines and uh, various transdisciplinary applications. Now, as in Dr. Reynolds' presentation earlier, uh, he looked at classificational and relational definitions. And he also cautioned us to spend careful time and effort to define the classificational and relational uh, uh, factors. So you see in SNA, we tap on nodes and links, which I argue would approximate the classificational and relational in systems thinking. In terms of cascading of disasters, SNA will enable us to further visualize all of this is really based on visualization, how to uh, convey to our stakeholders uh, the system or the, the network. So how to visualize uh, critical infrastructures and networks in disaster studies. So as the cliche goes, and I quote, disasters are natural, but the calamities are culturally exacerbated, end of quote. So SNA can allow us to further study the cultural factors that exacerbate disasters. SNA can aid in the identification of vulnerabilities in the geographies of vulnerability, to use Professor Tangonen's terms. And uh, it's interesting to note that even geography tackles two integral and complementary components, cultural geography and physical geography. And again, transdisciplinarily, uh, we can bring this uh, two together. Um, so SNA is also an approach that further elucidates on supply chains as presented by uh, Professor Tangonan. So it uh, fleshes out connectivities and precisely because it tackles not only the diagrammatic structure, but also sheds light on the agentive relations that so-called gatekeeping factors they bring into the uh, formula. For instance, in the case of incident command system in post-disaster response as mandated the RA-10121, so we can really apply this social network analysis to look at uh, the gatekeepers, basically, and uh, how it affects the structure, the implementation of the response. So uh, I won't take too much of your time, but just to uh, just quickly, uh, so visualization, everything's visualization. So with SNA, uh, I guess I just uh, end with three things. So uh, with uh, social network analysis, we can lay out the structure based on attributes, attributes as in scatter plotting. We can also use ordination. Um, one technique is uh, multidimensional scaling or MDS. And finally, uh, graph layout algorithms wherein we operate through um, a list of criterion. So to sum up, systems approach cascading disasters, the social network analysis are, to use Mom Tony's word, 
and I believe are parts of a tool or the toolkit of a system thinker. And the latitude of tools discussed today further underscores the importance of a transdisciplinary approach to systems thinking for resilient and inclusive development, as uh, Mom Emma Poria uh, so nicely puts it. Thank you very much and have a good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Meigs, and for tying all together the discussions this morning. No? Um, for, for our next, thank you all to our panelists. No? For our next session, I'd like to call back Dr. Emma to um, perhaps to ask for responses from our keynote lectures today. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. I hope you enjoyed very much all the insights, the wisdom, and all the excellent, excellent analysis using systems thinking. So uh, I would like to call on now to our distinguished um, keynote speakers to say your last words of wisdom. One minute, <laughs> two minutes, because we are about to end this webinar. OK. Uh, who will go first? Dr. Uh, Bill Reynolds? Can you say your last? Yeah, because it's late here and it's time to go to bed. I know. You have to, so. <laughs> you have to sleep there. No, th this has been an excellent webinar. I I've learned an awful lot from from Greg's talk, from the uh, commentators, and it it's fairly obvious that systems thinking is the way that we're going to move forward. There's absolutely no question about that because everybody's talking about transdisciplinary studies and transdisciplinary research. And the only way to do that is to approach it as a system. I personally think that the visualization that comes out of systems analysis is an excellent way to communicate this, not only to professionals, but also to the people in the communities that are gonna be affected by all this stuff. They can see the relationships and I think it's the way to go. It's very, very interesting. And I thank you very much for inviting me and participating in this, Dr. Perio, Emma. So and thank you very much. By the way, you will be roped in into the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Anthropological and Sociological Initiative in Ateneo. So watch out. I'll pull you back here from Virginia. Okay? And same thing with Greg. Can we hear from you, Greg? I yeah, hope you'll come back to us soon. <laughs> I hope to come back soon. I got all my shots and I hope that I can come back. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed actually our transdisciplinary work and research that we've done. Uh, yeah, and it's been quite enlightening to, uh, to me to talk about trust networks and others. I, I was struck by when I was doing all, all this and I, I, I looked at the, the after effects on the fragile populations of, of people in Japan. And I think we, we, we all as a group ought to really learn uh, what what it is, what's going on to the, that fragile population, because we have fragile populations all around us. Um, and I think it's only through this kind of collaboration, multidisciplinary collaboration, and maybe international collaboration, that we're going to get to the to, to the, the the nub and the and the substance of of, of what it is to 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 have experienced the, these cascades. Um, so I look forward to maybe designing some new experiments that we can do on, uh, on how we cope with heat and we learn about coping strategies in, in, in very hot weather. So we can design some experiments that we have to do together and it's not just the physical science types, but we have to do it with the sociologists. And uh, I, I look forward to more collaborations. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg and Bill. I really think that you know, there's hope. There is hope if we all, you know, work together. So I would like, you know, Tony Yolo Saga has to be called in an emergency. So, you know, I have to close this because we are now close to 11 o'clock. We always make our, you know, webinars on time and like that. So in closing, I would say systems thinking towards resilient and inclusive development is innovative, collaborative, and you must navigate the systems uh, because systems thinking is also iterative and transformative. As I always tell my MDRR students that Greg and Migs are, or were teaching, problem focused, 
solutions driven with the systems lens. And I also tell them, please note, we are just a dot in the whole spectrum of universe. And we must connect the dots, as Job, Steve Jobs said, in order to make sense and to make purpose and meaning in our lives and the way we do our work. And hopefully, I always tell also the scientists, we're only as good as our data. We're only as good as our theoretical, methodological, and analytical tools. And I always tell my class, you have been supported by society, so you must return your scientific tools, your analytical capacities to help solve society's problems. Okay, so uh, I always say uh, I'm very happy that in this uh, CICAR PH Transdisciplinary Action Research Program, I'm working with very brilliant people, very humble, and very good in their craft. And I think we have to be together, and I always say we have to link our tools in order that we can solve systemic problems. I always tell people that Bakit Batayang Pilipino? We're visited by 20 typhoons a year. And every year we repeat the same protocol. Para tayong sisisifos. When the typhoon comes, the rock falls. After the typhoon, we push the rock. And it seems like, ano ba? Haven't we learned? So I hope to all my students who are listening here, remember what I told you. It doesn't take talent to complain but it takes talent to provide solutions. So you decide which side you should be in. And I hope you will be interested in working with us. We are working very much with National Resilience Council, as they say, prepare, adapt, and transform. Because if you don't prepare, the disaster will happen. You don't adapt, disasters happen, and you must transform your ways of doing things, your structures and processes, so that you can become resilient. Look at the resilience scorecards. Measure your science, your data against it. And then I would say to my students and to all who have been through me in Master of Social Transfer Development, then you're worthy of getting our degree in Master in Social Transfer Development and also in getting three units in my systems thinking for resilience and development. So in closing, let me thank all our brilliant speakers, our panelists, and also all my partners in SICAR and NRC work. Uh, I would like to have a special shout out to my colleagues at the National Resilience Council, Ms. Tony, Debbie, Malou, Marilou, Bong, Florence, everyone. Because I think we could not have done this thing had we not done all those workshops with this climate disaster assessment training with the uh, LGUs and partners with National Resilience Council. So thank you very much. You um, hope you will watch out our next line of webinars. I think I have asked Nandi already to give us an adaptive social protection webinar uh, in May. So thank you very much. Also, I would like to say that with the National Resilience Council, the Ateneo de Manila and the Manila Observatory is offering a deep in, uh, de, uh, is supporting the deepening systems thinking course of the National Resilience Council with its partner LGU. So watch out for those things. Those are very important if we have to learn. I really feel that in the new normal, we have to retool, we have to reframe, we have to recast and reinvent the ways we do but at the same time with integrity and honor. Thank you very much. We'll see you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Migs and all, and to all my partners at Anadema Innovation Center, Manila Observatory, and the NRC. And to all the audience here who are listening, thank you.